pray together. Father, we know that you have done a good work in us. And Lord, you have continued to help us grow, to make us grow more and more like Jesus each and every day of our lives. And Father, as we come and we find you in your word today, Lord, we pray that you will share, show us different ways that we might help others grow to become more and more like Christ. As we disciple one another in your love, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to start this morning by playing a little game with you. I'm going to show a logo of, on the screen, and I want you just to yell out to me uh, what they make. Appliances, yeah, washing machines, dryers, Whirlpool, some of you might own one of those. Cereal. cereal, yeah, you read the back of that box every day, don't you? General Mills makes cereal, who's this? Yeah, construction equipment, excavators. Someone said it, what do we make? We make disciples. That's what we make. If you don't know why you're coming, it makes it a little tricky to know what to make, right? You can't imagine showing up at one company and not knowing exactly what you're supposed to be doing there. When you come, part of what we do is we make disciples. We've been going through our series is that we are to live for Christ. And part of the action component of living for Christ is that we are to be ministers uh, to, to one another. We are to serve one another. Do you remember that a few weeks ago we talked about serving the way that Christ served, we must also serve in the fact that he was willing to give his life for us, so we must be willing to do that for a brother or sister. The, the week after that, we talked about that we are to encourage one another, and we said we encourage each other in two ways. We encourage each other toward, anyone paid attention last week? Love, Love and we encourage each other to do good works. That's why we come, right? Being part of the church is part of the task that we do. We encourage each other toward love and to do good works. And this week, as a church family, we are talking about how we might incur <clears throat> how we might disciple one another. And it all ro revolves around this Ephesians 4:15, which is the hope of the church is that if as we speak truth in love, right? As we speak truth in love, we will in all things grow up to him. Who's him? He is the head, that is Christ. So the head of the church is Christ. As the church together grows, we are growing up to be more and more like the head who is Christ. We do that by speaking truth in love. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. In case you didn't know, that's really why we're here. We're to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The local church provides the most significant arena through which disciple making happens, except for maybe in your own homes when you're discipling your children. Right? So the church has a big role in being part of the fact that we are to make disciples. Well, where do we get this idea from? Where does it come from that we are to make disciples? Do you remember Jesus, after he raises from the dead, Matthew 28, gathers the disciples together, and then he says, all power and authority has been given to me. Right? All power and authority has been given to me. Therefore, therefore, here's what you do. You go and you make disciples of all the nations. That's what we're to do. That's, the, that's our job as a church. This is the thing that we make. We don't make appliances here. We make disciples. So how does that happen? He tells you in the very next sentence. How do you go and make disciples? You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So the beginning part is you baptize. They come by faith, right? receive grace by God, and then what happens is then they are baptized, but it doesn't end there. They then are taught the commands of Christ. So, <clears throat> we know this to be part of what Jesus does. Jesus has himself disciples, but when we talk about disciples, we often think of the 12, right? Jesus ends up having more than the 12 disciples, but usually that's what we think of. But then, when he tells the disciples to go and make disciples, it says then in Acts 14, 21, then he preached the gospel to the city. Sorry, they, the disciples continued to preach gospel to the city, and they made many disciples. Even the disciples make disciples. So you and I, when our call is to make disciples, you and I who are disciples are to make disciples. How many of you know that you as a baptized believer are a disciple of Jesus? Good, I'm glad. 
And the reason why I ask that, it seems like a silly question, but it's not. I remember having a conversation with a woman who was uh, in her 70s or 80s, and she had never seen herself as a disciple of Christ. She looked at the 12 disciples and said, oh, I understand that they're disciples, but a disciple is one who follows Christ, and he chose us. And if you never think of yourself as a disciple, then you will never see yourself in the light of actually doing the work of the disciples. So what does it mean when you're a disciple? Well, you're actually called by Christ. The disciples don't choose Jesus. Jesus chose them, if you remember, he says to his disciples. You're identified by your belief, your faith in Christ, and that you are made into something new. One time you were not a disciple of Christ, but now you are a disciple of Christ. So what do we do? We're attached and we follow Christ, right? So we pick up our cross daily. There's this call to suffering. We pick up our cross daily. It's not only an external walk like Judas, where we walk along and we watch what happens, but we're actually involved, right? We become more and more like Jesus. We become more and more like the, ma the master. We have the same message, the same ministry. What's the message? We preach the gospel. Christ's life is perfection. He is the one perfect sacrifice. God who became flesh, who then dies on the cross for the forgiveness of sin, for those who believe, right? And that's the message. We have the gospel, that he rose from the dead. And as he rose from the dead, then you and I can now see he has returned to the Father and he will one day return. We continue to preach that same message. We have a similar, we have the same ministry. We have the same compassion. We are all part of the same family. We all should serve one another. And we experience, in some ways, the same suffering as Christ in the sense that we can be persecuted for being Christians. And so how do we sustain the fact we are sustained? It says in Scripture, as we talked about last week, if you, if you remain in my word, then you truly are disciples of mine. Because here's what it comes down to, is if we are to go into, we baptize, and then we teach others to obey the commands of Christ. Well, where do we find them? We find them in the very words of Christ. The Scriptures tell us what we are to teach others who become Christians and become disciples. And so we ourselves, if we're going to be the ones who are disciples, we ourselves must know the word well enough that we are able to disciple others to know the word as well. So here's the question for us. <clears throat> How are you doing in your discipleship making? Are, are you... Are you helping others along? Are you discipling well? Because sometimes we only think of ourselves as the ones who are being served, and we never think of those that we must serve. This is partly why I like this, this series, is because when we're called to encourage one another to be ministers, or we're called to serve one another, or we're called to disciple others, we stop thinking of ourselves first, and we start thinking of those around us. And you and I, as disciples of Christ are to disciple one another. We admonish one another in the word. So what stops us? If we're having difficulty discipling others, what might stop us from doing that? And this is where I want to dive into scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, and I'm going to read from 1 to 15, or we're going to look at 1 to 15. And here is where Paul is dealing with the church in Corinth, and he's dealing with some divisions in the church. But here's the doctrine that is presented here. The doctrine that's presented here is if you always stay immature, if you stay as a child, you will never grow enough that you will be able to disciple someone else because you yourself are still immature. And how that immaturity happens or how it's shown out, Paul will describe here, it happens through our fighting, our jealousy with one another. So listen to these words. Brothers, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. So he's saying, I can't even address you as spiritual because you're too worldly. You are mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, meaning he gave them milk because they couldn't handle, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For, when some, for one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? So you can hear this dissension, this, there's some jealousy among them, there's some quarreling, and what are they quarreling about? 
I follow this guy and you follow that guy. And, and this becomes the division that happens, right? This, you can, this happens sometimes even in churches, right? I follow after this guy. So you can see the dissensions. You can see the factions that's happening. They're saying, I follow. So then he wants to get rid of all of the sort of differences that happens. And he addresses that in the next passage. What, after all, is Apollos? What is Paul? They're only servants through whom you came to believe. Right? He says, all we are is servants through whom you heard the gospel. As the Lord has assigned each his own task, right? So we each have that task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but who made it grow? God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes it grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his labor. So each has their own assigned task to do. Some water, some plant, but it's actually God who makes it grow. We are just instruments or servants of what God does, right? So we can't put our faith and trust in, in a man. Like the pastors, you will see even people like famous pastors who get on TV and stuff, they, they fall. And the question becomes is when they fall, who was my faith first in? Is my faith in that person? Well, he's just a mere man, Paul says. It's Christ who we look to. It's Christ that we put our faith in. It's Christ who is the one who is perfect in our eyes. The others are just instruments, he says. It's like when you go to the orchestra and you see the orchestra play, you don't clap for the violin. You're not like, oh, look at that violin. Look at that great violin. It doesn't play itself. Right? The, the person who's playing it is the one that we're like, oh, great job on learning how to play the violin. It's the same with us. It's like we're mere instruments. We're servants of the Lord who are just assigned our task to do. And so we continue to do that task. And so here's, the, here's what he then goes on to say. is He says in verse 6 and 7, when he talks about this, he says, I planted Apollo's water, but God made it grow. So neither the one who plants, in verse 7, nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. It is God who must make it grow. There is no form without God. There is no growth unless God is looking, is, is the one who actually makes it happen. And so when we're looking after things, we are still part of the process, but it's actually God who brings it to fruition. And we do this, it says in verse 7, by working together, right? Each has his own task, but it's one of us might plant the seed, one might water it, and eventually God makes it grow because we work and we labor this together. Verse 8, it then says that each will receive the reward for the labor. So here's the thing about God. When we labor for the Lord, He does reward us. Right? God does reward us for the labors that we have. But our labors are not based on production because we're not the ones who make it grow. We are faithful to the task in front of us. And I'll give you an illustration of this. When you look in the Old Testament, you look at and compare two different prophets. Let's say we compare Jeremiah against Jonah. Jeremiah, if you look at his ministry from a worldly point of view, was a failure. He was faithful to the Lord, but no one ever listened to the man. No one ever repented of their sins and came to the Lord. And in fact, he goes with the exiles who end up in Egypt and he dies somewhere in Egypt. He doesn't even get to go with the exiles to Babylon. But then you look at someone like Jonah, who was unfaithful to the Lord, in fact, wanted to run away. But when he shows up in Nineveh, he doesn't even want to preach to the Ninevites, but he does. And God makes it grow. People believe. One is faithful, Jeremiah, and he produces very little. The other is unfaithful, and it produces much. So your labor is what matters, right? The labor matters, not production, because God chooses whether there's production or not. And then he goes on into verse 9. And this is very important for us. For we are God's fellow workers. We work with God in this. God makes it grow, but we are fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. And someone else is building on that. But each one should be careful how they build, right? So as we're building disciples, we need to be careful how we build. For no one can lay a foundation other than that 
which is already laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. So, I want to talk about this foundation that we build on a little bit. <coughs> let, me, let me bring it this way. The gospel has been preached in North America for many years. After World War II, the gospel tended to be preached a certain way where we ask people to respond to an altar call. Where if you just pray a certain prayer and put your faith in Christ, you will be Christian. But what we rarely ever did with that is ask people to be disciples. We just ask them to believe and, oh, now I'm a Christian and now I can put my feet up and I can watch Netflix at home. <laughs> there is no call for carrying your cross. There is no call to remain in the Word. All there was was this call, well, my salvation is done and all is good with me. That is the most dangerous thing that you can do in Christianity. The reason why it is dangerous is because how do you actually tell whether someone is saved or not? The way you tell is by the fruit that they bear, right? And the fruit, some of the things that they do is disciples make disciples. And if you have none of that, the question is, am I truly saved or not? And so we get this cheap grace. God saves you, but it was only for your benefit. That's what Paul is saying here, is that we are building on a foundation. That foundation is the gospel, is Christ. Christ is the foundation. Which we, It's not church tradition. We don't build on church tradition. We don't build on like this sort of thing, like just come to faith and Jesus will, will save you. There, there must be a response. You must work. We are fellow workers with God. You can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian and sit around. Like the disciples didn't just say, oh, Jesus rose from the dead and I'm a disciple of his, wonderful, and then they all went home and watched Netflix. They, they didn't have Netflix back then. They didn't even have TV. Can you believe that? No wonder they're out preaching. No. But that's the point, right? That is the point. In our world, we never call people to this strong discipleship, right? A life of the cross and sacrifice. Discipleship is that. It's deep community. It's, it's showing each other that it is through Christ and our confession of faith and our repentance of sin that you and I come to belief. That foundation is laid upon Christ because that is where we build. Because what we build or how we build matters. And Philippians 1, 5 and 6 tells us that that work is done by God. We are in a partnership in the gospel, right? So we are in partnership. You came to believe because of the good news from that first day until now. Being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. What is the good work that he, that he first began in you? He saved you from your sins. You confessed him as Lord and Savior. He will continue to build that good work in you so that others might do the same. Disciples make disciples. That's what we do. That is our purpose. And who are we building upon? We're building upon that good and firm foundation because the material that we use to build matters. It says this in Acts 3. The stone whom you rejected is now become the cornerstone of what? The kingdom of God. The very kingdom of God is preached. And those who come into the kingdom is built upon the foundation of one. And that is Jesus Christ. It is him we proclaim. He is the one who does the work and not us. So, here's the thing. We are judged by this. There is a judgment upon how well we are continuing to do the work of building upon the foundation and what material we're doing for this. You, as a Christian, we're not saved for you alone. So the question is, are you discipling disciples? Are, are you, if you're not, maybe I'm a new Christian. But, so here's the point. You've got to get to a place where you're serving others, where you're discipling other disciples. You can look around your family and probably find someone who needs a little bit of help with this discipling. Or, or, hey, even your pastor needs help and needs to be discipled. It's true. We disciple one another. We admonish one another. Sharp, iron sharpens iron. We work for this for one another. And I'm going to leave you with this warning that comes in the next few verses. Because even though you might be saved, it might be a very close 
salvation for you. And it's not that your works save you. I'm not trying to say that. Your works don't save you. God makes it grow, but he still calls us into a task that is before us. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. If any man builds on this foundation, the foundation being Christ, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. So your work is going to be shown. How you build matters, and the material that you use matters, because the day, the day of Jesus, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, right? So if you continue to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel, if you continue to build upon the foundation and disciples make disciples and make disciples, if those people that you have taught the scriptures to, right? If, if, there is a, if they survive, the quality will be shown. If what he built survives, he will receive his reward. God will reward you. But if it's burned up, you will suffer loss. He will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. You'll still be saved. This is not a salvation issue. You'll be saved, but you'll only be saved as one who just barely makes it, who escapes through the flames yourself. Because you were never saved for solely yourself. You were saved so that others might come to know Christ. Disciples make disciples. That's hard teaching for us to hear. But we're not just going to sit around and put our feet up and pretend like things don't matter and that it's not important that others know Christ because we are talking about life and death, salvation of souls. That's an important job for us because what do we do, people? What do we make? Disciples. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you are our foundation upon which all things we build. And Lord, sometimes when we look at our own lives, we recognize that we have maybe even tried to use material that shouldn't be used. And so, Lord, we pray that we might be encouraged along to disciple one another, that we wouldn't be arguing and fighting, but that even as a church, we wouldn't be jealous of one another, but that we would encourage each other and be joyful with one another when others come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, you have given us a great task before us, and you have called us to know your word and to teach those commands to others. So, Lord, we pray that you will do that, that you will make it grow as we water and as we plant. But, Lord, we know that no growth happens unless you make it happen. So, Lord, may we be faithful in the labor that is before us, not because we know we're, sa not because we're saved through that work, but, Lord, as a response to what you have done for us. We know there are others who you are calling. We know there are others that you have chosen, and, Lord, we pray that we might faithfully bring the word to them and teach them all the commands in love and truth. We pray that in Christ's name. Let's stand and sing together as we...